Yeah, Unless you know to look at CERN specifically. Root, root CERN probably works. Yeah. Well, it's just cern.ch slash root, I think, is where you go. So. <coughs> okay, we're, we've cracked 40. So it's your call, you're in after. charge. I think, I think we should start. Um, great. So welcome to the very last day of TASI. I am wearing my TASI shirt from 2013 which is Peter Higgs with his Nobel Prize slash glue infusion Higgs doublet, which I love, <laughs> but apparently other people hate. Um, and um, the first lecture today is Joe Licken giving his fourth and final lecture on quantum information science for particle theorists. Please go ahead. And I have my quantum computing t-shirt on today. So that's a collector's item. All right, so last lecture, I wanna make this uh, as fun as possible. I am going to show you how far we've come towards uh, simulating QCD on a quantum computer, which is something you'd certainly like to do, but we're not there yet. In fact, we're, it's really just baby steps, but it's, I think the baby steps are interesting. And then I'm gonna do one more experiment live on the CERC quantum simulator. I'm gonna simulate something called the butterfly effect, which is pretty cool. And it's something that you, you can do. And then I'm going to finish the lecture with a bunch of propaganda about things we're doing at Fermilab. So certainly you would like to be able to simulate, you know, interesting quantum field theories, especially ones that have strong dynamics like QCD on quantum computers. And if you could really do that, there's, there's, there's certainly useful things that you'd be able to do. Um, but the problem that we have at the moment is that for quantum computers and, and QCD, we're sort of where the lattice gauge theory people were circa 1979. And this is a figure I stole from a talk by Yannick Maurice, where he's, he claims at least that this is what uh, the lattice people were using in, in 1979 to do lattice simulations of not QCD, but Z2 gauge theories on a, on a small lattice. So that's, I, th I think that is more or less where we are with quantum computers. The, the quantum computers themselves only have a small number of qubits. You can only do pretty simple programs and you can't do QCD. But, you know, you got to start somewhere. And, and the lattice people had the vision to say, you know, someday we're going to get the computers really want. So let's start figuring out how to do things now. And that, that vision turned out to be correct and, and very important that they started down that road. So I think it's a similar thing here. And I think there's lots of interesting things to do. And in fact, you're getting in on the ground floor when you do something like this. So that's always a good thing. Um, but I wanted to go through some of the steps that you have to deal with on the road to doing something like simulating QCD. So one thing we already did uh, yesterday was you've got to discretize space to some kind of spatial lattice. So when I talk about quantum field theory, it'll be at separately at every spatial point. So we already talked about that yesterday. Uh, if I'm doing, say, scalar field theory, I also have to discretize the scalar field values themselves, right? If I have a scalar field, even at one spatial point, um, it can take values from principle from, min from minus infinity to infinity for a real scalar field. So what do I do about that? So there, what you have to do is you have to limit the, the actual values. You have to discretize the values of the field uh, to some finite number so that you can map the field values themselves onto some finite number of qubits. So for example, uh, suppose I only was wanted to use three qubits to represent the scalar field at every spatial point, then I, this, I can't represent more than eight values for the field. So I might do it this way. Here's, here's an example where I've got three qubits. And so I've got, here's my three qubits and they can, there's a zero or one basis state for each of them. And I can represent the scalar field by doing some mapping like this onto discrete values where this is in some unit. But as you see here, I can go maybe from seven to minus seven in, in units of two, but that's it. It poops out at some point with a finite number of qubits. So that actually sounds already pretty bad, like you should just completely give up. But it turns out this is one of the cases where even though it looks bad, it turns out it's actually not bad. And in this particular case, it has to do with something 
it actually has to do with the properties of uh, Fourier transforms, but the fancy name for this is the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, which is the same Shannon that invented Shannon entropy. And what this tells you is that for things like the eigenfunctions of harmonic oscillators, which is what at least you're starting out with with scalar field theory, um, you can get away with an amazingly small number of uh, discrete points in order to represent pretty complicated looking eigenfunctions. So here's an example. I've taken the, the n equals 16 eigenfunction of a single oscillator, which is a really wiggly uh, graph as you see here. And it turns out, and I checked this on Mathematica just, just to see, that just sampling it at 32 points, which would be the equivalent of five qubits, uh, gives you five digit accuracy for this wiggly looking function. So you see the 32 points that I've sampled at here using an algorithm that's well known to people in this in this line of work. And that's good enough to get five dig digit accuracy on, on the physics in the end that you're interested in. So you could have, so this whole thing could have just collapsed right there if it weren't for the fact that there's, there turns out to be very powerful methods for doing things like uh, discretizing scalar fields. So that's good. Another sticky problem, which isn't entirely solved, has to do with how do you do fermions on quantum computers? You might say, well, quantum computers take values zeros and ones. That kind of sounds like fermions. And indeed, Pauli matrices, which as I told you at the end is what you're really always doing on these uh, quantum computers with your qubits. Uh, a Pauli matrix, the Pauli is acting as a qubit can have anti-commutation relations. You just look at the, the properties of the Pauli matrices. But the problem with that is that if I have two poly matrices acting on two different qubits, those guys commute. Whereas, of course, fermions at different spatial sites still anti-commute. And so you have to cook up some way, if you want to do fermions on a quantum computer, of getting whatever, whatever combination of poly matrices represents the fermions to anti-commute even for things that represent different spatial sites. And that forces you to do something that looks pretty non-local. That's the only known way, at least, of getting out of this. And the, the, uh, the most famous way of doing that is something called the jordan Bigner transformation. Um, and you see it looks pretty non-local. Here I've written uh, just a pair of fermion creation annihilation operators in terms of poly matrices. But you see I need a whole string of poly matrices uh, here I'm assuming that I have a one-dimensional spatial lattice and I need a whole string of poly matrices in order to represent these fermion creation annihilation operators. So that, that actually works if I have a one-dimensional spatial lattice. It doesn't uh, translate very well to higher dimensions, um, but that's the kind of thing you're forced into doing. What else do you have to do? You have to discretize the gauge degrees of freedom if you want to do gauge theories. So if I want to do QCD, I want to do SU3. Uh, the simplest non-abelian case would be SU2. That's still too hard, although people are working on how to really discretize in terms of qubits, SU2 and SU3 uh, gauge transformations and degrees of freedom. Uh, but if you really want to run something on a quantum computer in the near future, that's actually too hard. And so what people are actually doing who want to run on quantum computers they're looking at discrete abelian subgroups of the groups you really care about, like SU2. So for example, D4, which is a discrete non-abelian subgroup, it's the symmetries of the square, uh, basically. Uh, that's something you can do with qubits. It's only got two generators, as, as you see here. And uh, one of them is poly x, so it squares to itself. And the other one doesn't square to itself, but it, the fourth power gets back to the identity. So if you have three qubits per site, that's enough to represent the, all the gauge properties of this discrete non-abelian subgroup D4. So that's, that's an example of the kind of thing, the kind of simplification you're forced into. So I can do non-abelian gauge theories. They're just not the ones that you're used to. They're these simpler discrete versions. Um, there's a question in the chat. Yeah, okay. What are the criteria to choose which subgroup works best? Uh, that's a good question. I think nobody knows. People started out using actually just Z2 is the simplest thing you can think about, which um, or Zn. Uh, that's good enough to do something like the Schwinger model. And in fact, the first interesting, but I would say from high energy physics point of view, the first interesting models to actually run in quantum computers were some discrete type version of the Schwinger model. 
but there you don't even get to talk about things like plaquettes. So D4 is really the simple, it's the first example I know of where you get to even talk in the language of gauge theories. But people have gone beyond that. There are much bigger discrete groups which have funny names. Um, and I think people are still just exploring that. But thanks, that's, that's an excellent question. Okay, uh, one thing I ignored was it's, of course, you don't just have the field, you have the conjugate to the field of, in the case of the scalar field, there's, there's the pies that I was using yesterday. So what do you do about those? There, of course, the smart thing to do is, is to figure out what to do with the phi's and then to use a Fourier transform to figure out what to do with the pies. And that's indeed what people do on quantum computers. This requires you to have some version of a Fourier transform that works on a quantum computer. But in fact, this is the thing that Peter Shore did in 1994, because it turns out that to uh, break RSA encryption and bring the world to its knees, the, the quantum thing that you actually have to be able to do uh, exponentially well on a quantum computer is a quantum Fourier transform. So that's already a solved problem. And then another solved problem, which again, you might've thought was gonna be a disaster, was I've been talking about doing time evolution now with e to the minus iht, but you know, in general, that Hamiltonian is gonna have a bunch of pieces that don't commute with each other. <clears throat> Let's look even at the simplest case where it has two pieces that don't commute with each other. Then you've got your time evolution operator is e to let's say a plus b where a and b don't commute. So now if you just try to power series expand that, it's gonna be a nightmare, right? Because of the fact that these pieces don't commute. So what am I supposed to do about that? Because in, in the end, I have to, I'm always doing some kind of power series expansion to represent this in terms of gate operations. So there the trick turns out to be something called Trotterization, which I don't know if it wasn't, again, there's a guy named Trotter or a person named Trotter. I don't know anything about Trotter, uh, and, but uh, the name has stuck. And Trotterization is you, you take something, you take an exponential of two things that don't commute and you rewrite it as a product of exponentials. And if there's just two of them, the smart thing to do, it turns out, is to write it as this product here. So e to the a over two, e to the b, e to the a over two. That, if you just look, compare the power series expansions, you will see that, yes, they don't agree, but the leading order correction that you would have thought was there, that's proportional to the commutator not being zero, that actually cancels. That's why there's this, this symmetrized behavior of putting the A over twos on either side. And then the corrections that you get are actually just from the higher order combinations of commutators. But still, this is not an exact relation. So I sort of said, not quite equal to. And there is an error. But then the other thing that you do in trotterization is you can prove that if you do uh, not the whole time evolution in one step, but you break it up into a bunch of steps called trotter steps that in the limit where you make those time steps sufficiently small, you can always make this remaining error as small as you want. And the number of trotter steps to, to do that is some, usually some reasonable number. In all the cases I've looked at, if you do 10 time steps, 10 trotter steps, that's good enough. So that's, that could have been a disaster, but it turns out not to be a disaster. And now we're good enough to do our last experiment. So I'm gonna go back to the, see if it's still live here. So this is our CERC quantum simulator, the one we used in lecture one. And we are now going to I mean, it's still live. It is live. We're going to install CERC, the quantum simulator. Okay, it's there. And some other junk. Uh, I have a little routine that allows me to compute entanglement entropy because I want to look at some things with entropy here. And now we're going to do a, a series of experiments. The first one is just to remind you of the basic idea of how we did these things. 
So remember how these quantum simulations work. You have to define some number of qubits. Here I'm just going to make two bell pairs. So I'm going to make two of these Alice Bob bell pairs. Uh, and remember the way that we do that is we use these Adamar gates, H, and these two qubit entangling gates called the C naught gates. So I, I make a couple of those. And then the only new thing that's in here, and I won't go through it in detail, but it's you have to teach us Python how to do partial traces of these things uh, in order to figure out entropies. So I won't go through that because it's not interesting, but the net result of that is a circuit like this. So I made two bell pairs. So Alice has two qubits and Bob has two qubits and they're 100% entangled. Um, here's a representation of, of the final state uh, density matrix and you see it has this diagonal uh, form. Um, and you see that here and here, the new thing is that I've computed the entropies. Actually, I think that's the final state wave function. I didn't do the density matrix. And here you see the entropy. So I've computed the entropy for just uh, one pair of these qubits. So I took one qubit each from Alice and Bob. And then I said, what's the entropy if I trace over Bob's qubit for Alice? And it turns out the entropy is one because it's maximal for one qubit. And the same thing for Bob if I trace over Alice's qubit. Uh, and the, remember, I defined this thing called the mutual information, which I get by combining these things. That's also maximal. So that's just reminding us that we know how to make these kinds of pairs. So now let's do something that's a little bit more non-trivial. Now I'm going to make six of these pairs. So I'm going to have 12 qubits in my circuit. So that's already a lot of qubits. It's uh, not the biggest quantum computer, but it's you need a pretty good quantum computer to do that. Um, and then I'm going to take them and actually do some non-trivial time evolution using this trotter trick. So that's, that's really new. So in order to do that, I need, first of all, a Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian that I picked for this is just an IC model, because that's, that's the simplest non-trivial dynamics that I know how to simulate, and it's easy to do because it's it just involves poly matrices to begin with. So I'm going to take an IC model. Uh, so the IC model is just a bunch of spins on a one dimensional lattice and I'm going to have various couplings for them, a couple nearest neighbors, and then uh, put in some extra poly matrices that could represent things like uh, magnetic fields turned on. But it's all just poly matrices. So that's my Hamiltonian with some coupling constants to do something. And then I have to represent the time evolution, the e to the minus ht of that IC model in terms of some actual gates. And so I can do that in terms of the gates that, that circ, uh, the Google quantum computers know how to do once I do this trotter trick of splitting things up. So here, if I'm talking about the IC model, the pieces that don't commute are the fact that the IC model Hamiltonian has both poly sigma Z and it also has poly sigma X and sigma X doesn't commute with sigma Z, as you know. So that's the piece that I have to split up using this trotter trick. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna take the sigma X piece and I'm gonna have that be what I was calling A in the previous, in the general case. So I'm gonna have here now in my trotter time evolution operator will have a UXT on either side that's that trick of putting e to the a over two on either side. And then everything else is just stuff that has poly sigma z. They, they all commute with each other. So that, that's everything else that's sitting in the middle. And these are all just represented now in terms of gates that the quantum computer is happy implementing. So that's not hard. So now I'm going to, so I'm doing that IC model time evolution on this whole system. So now you see it's got 12 qubits, it's six, six entangled with six. And then I do the time evolution. And now here's a plot as a function of time of the mutual information. So if these guys are maximally entangled, which is the way they certainly started out, this mutual information should be equal to two. And here I'm actually looking at not all of the qubits, I'm just looking at the entanglement of 
qubit number five with qubit number five, Alice's qubit five with Bob's qubit five. So I'm just looking at that pair. And I'm, they started out maximally entangled. And you see that here because their mutual information is equal to two. That's maximal entanglement. But then what you're seeing over time is that the entanglement is going down. Now this actually is a fake effect. This is just coming from the fact that once you do a non-trivial time evolution, you got some unitary operator that's essentially changing the basis. And so the thing that I was calling that pair of qubits at time t equals zero, at time t equal 18 or whatever we're looking at here, it's, it's not that pair anymore. That's not the maximally entangled any pair anymore because I, I, I did some complicated rearrangement of the basis. So this effect that you see here is, is a fake effect. It's a effect that you're, you, you don't, there are still 100% entangled pairs. You just don't know what they are anymore because you scrambled the basis. So this experiment is a failure because it doesn't teach us anything. So let me do the kind of thing that people actually do here when they want to look at entanglement as a function of time. So here's something I could certainly do. I could do the trotterized time evolution just on Alice's qubits. And I'll do it twice. I'll do it first backwards in time and then forwards in time by the same amount. So that should, that should certainly preserve the entanglement because if I do the time evolution backwards in time by some amount and then forwards in time by the same amount and it's all unitary, at the end of the day, I haven't, shouldn't have done anything and everything should be 100% entangled. So let me do that. That better work, otherwise my program's wrong. And indeed, it works. You see the plot now, they start out maximally entangled, this, this same pair. So I'm looking again at just the pair of Alice's, it's actually Alice's sixth qubit because the, the qubit labeling starts at zero. So I'm looking at QA5 with QB5, Alice's sixth qubit with Bob's sixth qubit. They start out maximally entangled, they stay maximally entangled. So that's just the statement that it really is unitary time evolution. It doesn't spoil these correlations. Okay. So now we're ready to do the butterfly effect. So for that, I'm actually going to have 13 qubits. So that's, that's the record number of qubits that you're going to see from me, but it's still easy for the, this quantum simulator to do 13 qubits. And now I'm going to, again, I'm going to take time evolved just Alice's qubits backwards in time by some amount. So that'll get me back to time minus t. But now I'm gonna do something at time minus t. I'm gonna swap in quantum information from the 13th qubit into Alice's first qubit. Then I'm gonna time evolve back again by the same amount as I did before. And now the question is, do we care that we swapped in this extra quantum information? So in our previous case, we time evolved backwards and time evolved forwards, and we found in the end that nothing happened, and everything, we just had six maximally entangled pairs. Now the question is, will I, will I notice, will Alice's qubit six and Bob's qubit six notice at any point that this extra quantum information got injected into the system? And if they notice it, what will they do? Will they, will they still be 100% correlated with each other, or will they change in some way? So that's, that's a real physics experiment. So let's do that one. So now look at the circuit here. So now the circuit is 13 qubits. There's a zero with qubit here, which has some non-trivial quantum information in it. It's, it's just some random state that I picked. And that is now at time minus t getting swapped in with Alice's qubit QA1. But I'm now going to look just at uh, qubits QA6 and QB6. So I'm looking at the Alice qubit that's the furthest away from the stuff that got swapped in. And I'm, I'm looking at its correlation with Bob's qubit, corresponding qubit, as we go over time. So let's look at the second plot here, which is the interesting one. So this is now the mutual information between Alice's sixth qubit and Bob's sixth qubit. They start out 100% correlated because they're a bell pair. That's the way I made them. Ma maximally entangled. So mutual information is two. And then for quite a while, it stays two. 
So that makes sense because even though I swapped in this other information, I swapped it in on the other side of the circuit. And then the only thing that connects that, uh, that event with qubit six is this dynamics, this IC model dynamics that I put in. But of course it takes time for something to happen. And uh, how long it takes has to do with a property of the dynamics that's called scrambling. And scrambling is a reference to how quantum dynamics uh, moves the quantum information around in a circuit like this. So if I have a good scrambler, it will, uh, it will move the quantum information around in a short time. If I have a poor scrambler, it'll move it around inefficiently. So here what we find is that there's some time, characteristic time that's in, in these units is uh, something like time t equals six, where the qubit, they don't care, they don't care, they don't care, they don't care, and all of a sudden they care. And, and you can see that they care because all of a sudden now Alice's qubit six and Bob's qubit six are becoming less entangled. And in fact, as you see here by time t equal 10, they're almost completely unentangled anymore. So something has happened. The, the, these nice bell pair correlations that I set up have been destroyed at some characteristic time by the dynamics uh, that is communicating this swapping that I did on the other side of the system. And this is called the butterfly effect. The butterfly was the swapping in of, of a little bit of quantum information uh, in part of the system. And then, you know, the butterfly effect is a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil and that causes uh, the, uh, the hurricane to hit Miami rather than South Carolina. So this is, is an, an example of that in a much smaller scale, but it's still interesting. And this relates to lots of other things we're interested in uh, in quantum information. So, so here's the first example of you know, real quantum dynamics doing something interesting in a real quantum computer circuit that you could actually run. And it's not QCD, but there's already interesting stuff you can do with this kind of physics. All right, so that was my last experiment. Let's go back. So realistically, how close are we today to simulating real-time QCD processes on a quantum computer? Things that would be hard to do by conventional techniques. Uh, here's an example of a paper which I think captures what people who are really doing this are really doing. This is a paper by Hank Lamb and his collaborators. Uh, so they're doing this D4 gauge theory. So they're doing D4 gauge theory. They're doing it in not three plus one dimensions, but two plus one dimensions. And furthermore, uh, two dimensions, at least I can talk about plaquettes, but they're only doing two plaquettes. And so in fact, uh, they're only doing a, a total of 14 qubits to represent all of the degrees of freedom of this gauge theory. Well, they have to do something like that because if you wanna run it on a real quantum computer, uh, you have to have some reasonable number of qubits like that. The thing that actually limits this kind of simulation is if you actually now count how many gate operations I have to do in order to do the time evolution of this actual gauge theory, even though it's very simplified, the answer is you need about 200 gate operations per trotter step. And remember I said you might, in the end of the day, want on the order of 10 trotter steps to really have something uh, that was highly accurate. So that is already pushing the state of the art. In fact, there is no existing uh, quantum computer where you can run 2000 gates which is what you might want to do here. Um, but there will be, they're getting there. It's, it's, it's getting close. So I, I think this, this pretty accurately represents the state of the art of something that clearly is a gauge theory. It's not QCD. And it is something which you can more or less run now or two years from now. And if you, if you run it, this was run on a simulator, what you find is that you get very complicated behavior. So this is looking in real time at the expectation value for one of these plaquettes. And what you find is that indeed this, this thing's access is pretty much the whole Hilbert space. So here the Hilbert space has uh, two to the 14 states in it. It's already a lot. Uh, and, and the reason this dynamics is complicated is because it, it, it really cares about the whole Hilbert space as, as far as you can tell. So if you really wanted to know about this in detail, eventually you are gonna need a quantum computer 
to simulate something like this. Okay. So that's state of the art. So now we're going to, I'm going to finish up with the uh, propaganda and I have nice pictures that go with, go with it. So what are, I, there's a bigger world out there. I, these are uh, theory lectures, but of course, theor, part of your job as theorists is to understand what people are going to be doing with experiments. And in the quantum world, it's not just interesting theoretically, it's also extremely interesting in terms of enabling new kinds of experiments. So I do want to talk about that because that's something that a bunch of you might want to get involved in. So what I've been talking about so far is mostly has to do with uh, doing simulations on quantum computers. That is something we're doing at Fermilab. They're doing it other places. Um, there's, there's lots of activity going on in the high energy physics community, in the nuclear physics community, uh, condensed matter people, chemists are doing this. There's lots of people trying to find pieces of interesting science problems that you can do on quantum computers that will exist you know, either now or in the relatively near future. Hey, Joe, there's uh, a few questions in the chat. Yeah, let me get to the chat here. Okay. Ah, so there's a question when I was doing the IC model, what was the initial state I was taking in terms of spins on the sites? Um, so I was actually taking these, uh, so, uh, I'm taking my qubit states zero and one to be the two spins on the site in the, in the, in the IC model sense. And then I was, my initial state was these bell pairs. And so in fact, I was taking things to be in superpositions of the spins being up and down. So my initial state in this case was actually fairly complicated entangled superposition. Okay. And then there was a question of, would this be considered Monte Carlo, the kind of uh, thing that I was uh, showing you there? Um, well, I think fundamentally no, because because fundamentally the the trick of Monte Carlo, and this is you know one of the things that makes lattice gauge theory work, is that you're you're not looking at things that are wildly oscillating. You you have things that are basically suppressed by e to the minus, uh, you know something like e t, something that is gives you real exp, uh, exponential suppression instead of exponential oscillation, and that's that's the trick that allows you to not sample the whole Hilbert space, but, but just look at some small fraction of it. So that's, it's really quite different. Quantum computers are looking at the cases where the Monte Carlo isn't working. How long would a classical computer take to do the D4 QCD in two plus one dimensions? Um, so we do know the answer to that. And the answer is you can do it with a classical computer because it was done with a simulator, but uh, the reason they picked 14 qubits was because that was pretty much what they could handle with the classical simulator. So you don't have to go to too many qubits before the classical computers are having a hard time uh, keeping up with you. Okay, uh, I don't quite understand which part of quantum computers algorithm gives the edge over quantum computers say for, for QCD problems. Oh yeah, so let me, let me repeat that again. So this sort of diagram, in fact, if you look at everybody that writes a paper doing simulations of quantum field theories on quantum computers, they always have a plot like this. And it's because this plot, what this plot is telling you is if you look at what it means, is it, what, what it's really telling you is how the dynamics is sort of sampling the full Hilbert space of eigenstates, of, of states that, that are available to the system. And you know, given some initial starting point. And what it's telling you in all these cases, all the plots that you see in all the papers, is that in fact, this dynamics, this real time dynamics, basically samples arbitrary superpositions of non trivial superpositions of the whole Hilbert space. So that's what this wiggly line is actually representing. And so that's, that's what's telling you that a quantum computer may give you a quantum advantage because the quantum computer has no trouble doing that as long as I can simulate this thing at all on the quantum computer. It doesn't care which part of the Hilbert space you want to move around and it's all there. Whereas conventional, for example, Monte Carlo simulations fundamentally are not attempting to do that. So whether that's good for, so first of all, whether that's good for anything depends on uh, whether I can map a problem I'm interested in onto a realistic number of qubits. So in the case of QCD, we don't know how to do that yet because we don't have enough qubits available. 
And then secondly, do I actually care about this crazy oscillating behavior um, for an interesting problem? There are certainly things in QCD that can be mapped into that. If you just look at things like um, deep and elastic scattering, if you say, what's, what's the quark distribution that I am sampling in deep and elastic scattering? You can look up the formula for that in, in the books and you'll see that it's, it's, it's a real time correlator. It's one of these things. It's one of these things that presumably is wildly oscillating. And so people don't actually compute parton distributions from first principles, even though you can write down a formula for something that in principle is computable. So there ought to be things like this that, that you could do on quantum computers once we have the power to do them. Okay, and then there was a question of blue versus red data points. Ah, so this is, uh, thank you for asking that because this is showing the uh, relative error, the relative difference, depending on how finely you slice this in terms of trotter steps. So uh, the red points and the blue points was using different um, numbers of trotter steps to try. And so if there was no error from the, from the trotterization of these things, then the red and blue uh, points should be exactly on top of each other. But you see that they aren't. And I believe that the blue points uh, are taking coarser trotter steps and therefore give you coarser answers and the red points are taking finer trotter steps. Thank you, those are all good questions. All right. Okay, so now back to what are people actually doing? So these are things we're actually doing at Fermilab, but this is, there's a whole community of people and they're all doing this stuff and this sort of covers everything we're doing. So simulations we talked about. Um, I was just starting to talk about uh, quantum communication. So we looked at quantum teleportation. That's becoming a big thing now. I gave you an example of that. Then there's how do you actually build better quantum computers? So for QCD, we'd like you know a million qubits. So who's going to go build that for us? Um, well, maybe we're going to do it ourselves because, for example, the the current leading technology for qubits is involves superconducting devices. Actually, in high energy physics, we're some of the world's best people in terms of uh, designing and building systems with large numbers of superconducting devices. So maybe we'll build that computer. And then last but not least, this is a huge industry for high energy physics, is quantum sensors for dark matter. And this is just the following obvious observation. If I have the ability to make a qubit, it means I have the ability to make a device which I can control quantum mechanically that I can um, keep isolated from its environment so that it's, you know, it's not uh, experiencing quantum decoherence and, and other sources of disturbance. That is by definition a, a very sensitive sensing device. So qubits are quantum sensors or can be used to make better kinds of sensors for experiments like looking for dark matter. And I'll give you a couple examples like that. So on the algorithm side, one of the interesting things is that the big companies are also interested in figuring out what quantum computers are good for. And they, are, they want to work with high energy physicists because they know that we have interesting quantum problems. They know that we're not scared to work on things that are just getting off the ground. And so uh, Google, for example, reached out very early to some of the national labs and say, hey, can you know, help, help us find interesting things to do? And they worked with Fermilab and Oak Ridge. And we actually had, the reason I was using the CERC simulator is because uh, Google actually did their first uh, demo of the CERC software at Fermilab at, at one of our theory workshops. So we've been working with Google now on their quantum supremacy machine, which is the world's greatest quantum computer. There it is, 53 qubits. And these are some algorithms that were Fermilab people, theorists are actually working on that they're, they are running on this uh, 53 qubit quantum computer. So that's one thing you can do. Working with Google is fun too, because they have nice headquarters. Um, I mentioned that maybe high energy physicists will help build better quantum computers. And that was not an idle threat. Uh, we are working with Rigetti, which is about a $200 million startup, startup company that just all they do is build superconducting quantum computers. Uh, this, this guy here is Chad Rigetti, the founder of Rigetti. And they came to us and said, hey, you know, we have quantum computers, but we want to build better ones. Maybe you guys can help us. And 
the reason they think that is because they use these superconducting uh, qubit systems. Uh, one of the things you can do to make those qubit systems work better is you can put them in superconducting cavities. And we build superconducting cavities in Fermilab because we build them for accelerators. These are called SRF cavities. They're superconducting cavities made out of niobium that, uh, that their resonant frequency is in the microwave or a radio frequency range, sort of gigahertz range. And we build them for accelerators and we build the best cavities in the world because we that's what you need for accelerators. So you can imagine taking some kind of leap in that superconducting technology that maybe is the kind of thing you need to take you from 10 qubits that can do 100 gates to something more like at least 1,000 qubits that can do a million gates, something that would already get you into a much more interesting regime. And in fact, that's also not an idle threat in terms of what we can already do. You remember, I think I mentioned at some point that if you take the Google computer and you, you start running a program, after 100 microseconds, you're done because of quantum decoherence. So you do as many gate operations as you can in that 100 microseconds, because then your program's over and you got to start over again. Uh, people using uh, superconducting resonators like cavities have managed to get the quantum, de the quantum decoherence uh, to, to, they've held it off for as long as seven milliseconds, which is already a huge improvement. But by using these ca uh, cavities that we use for accelerators at Fermilab, we've already managed to get things that uh, stay coherent for on the order of seconds. In fact, I saw a live demo of this where you put a microwave photon into a cavity and you just ask, how long does it sit there without getting disturbed by anything? And you sits there for a few seconds. So I think there, there really could be, if you're sort of waiting for quantum computers to get more powerful and you say, oh, it's gonna take forever. I don't think it's gonna take forever. I think you're gonna see orders of magnitude jumps happening pretty soon and high energy physics might be a part of that. Another thing that involves big companies is, and I didn't talk about this yet, was the applications of quantum computing and quantum algorithms to machine learning, to, to AI. Um, there again, there's lots of people that have started looking at that. So we're working with Lockheed Martin, who's interested in this for reasons that they don't even tell us what the reasons are because they're a defense company. Um, but we know what our reasons are. We have lots and lots of interesting machine learning problems in high energy physics and, and they're hard. And so maybe there's, you know, some of them where using the quantum version of machine learning, you might get some advantage. So here's an example. This is something that's being led by Brian Nord at Fermilab. That's this guy here. And what he, he's interested in is strong lensing of, of uh, distance uh, galaxy images. This is something you can see in galaxy surveys like Dark Energy Survey or LSST. Uh, and that's a really difficult classification problem because strong lensing just means that the image is distorted. But images can be, the galaxy images can be distorted for other reasons, like maybe the galaxy itself is distorted. Um, so it's a really difficult classification problem. You can do it with conventional machine learning, but maybe quantum machine learning gives you some sort of advantage there. So that's, you can, that's a whole career right there. Okay, and then I mentioned dark matter detection. There's a huge number of people now jumping into this. And this really has to do with, you know, what's the future of dark matter detection in general, right? We have been focusing uh, most of the effort in high-energy physics on, on using these um, liquid xenon, uh, liquid argon type approaches where you can scale up to big detectors. And, and that's, that turned out to be a really good approach. And we have really powerful experiments uh, happening now, like the, the xenon one ton of Grand Sasso that just announced a, an interesting anomaly. So, so that's great, except that there's only a limited amount of liquid xenon in the world. And so at some point, you can't do that anymore. And then what are we gonna do? How are you gonna continue the experimental program for dark matter? And part of the problem there has to do with how sensitive can you make uh, sensing devices? And also, what are you actually looking for? Because uh, these xenon detectors, for example, are looking for WIMP-like dark matter in a certain mass range with certain assumptions about how it interacts with the, uh, the detector. But we don't really know that dark matter is in that mass range and we don't know exactly how it interacts with ordinary matter. And we need to have a variety of experiments that use a variety of assumptions about what it is that you're looking for. 
So for example, dark matter might be axions. In that case, uh, as Pierre Sakivi pointed out many, many years ago, uh, the way to detect it is with a resonant cavity where you actually convert the axion into a microwave photon. So that's, that sounds familiar. That sounds like what I was just talking about in quantum computers, and indeed it is. And so this that was uh, kind of an obvious thing to do. Uh, Aaron Cho, who's at uh, Fermilab, is a high energy physics experimentalist, got together with David Schuster, who's a quantum computer uh, cavity builder and uh, qubit builder at University of Chicago to say, well, why don't we just use all this uh, quantum computing technology and build an axion detector out of it? And that's something that's uh, turned out to be very successful. And uh, they have already shown that they can uh, make much more sensitive axion detectors using this kind of quantum technology uh, than you'd be able to do any other way. Uh, you know, at, at some point, all sensors have the problem uh, that you get noise from essentially quantum noise from the uncertainty principle. Uh, and the only way around that at some point, and so that's called the standard quantum limit here. And the only way around that is to use the fact that the uncertainty principle involves a product of two things. And therefore, if I don't care about my accuracy on one of the things in that product, uh, maybe I can do better on the other thing. So for example, if I just want to count photons and I don't care about the phase of, of the field that I'm looking at, uh, you have in principle the ability to do very, very sensitive counting of photons, which is what you want for an axion experiment, uh, well below what you would have considered the, the standard quantum limit from the uncertainty principle. So that's the trick they're pursuing. And then the other thing you can do with quantum technology is just think up entirely new experiments that you wouldn't have thought were possible and then do them. So here's an example of that. So I talked about these SRF cavities, these incredibly uh, uh, coherent cavities where you can put quantum information into them and it just sits there and then you can read it out later. So here's an example of an experiment that's based on that. It's called a dark photon experiment. So in that experiment, you have two of these cavities and one of them you operate in the mode we would operate them for, for an accelerator, which is for an accelerator, you're just trying to power things up. So you put as many photons at some frequency like a gigahertz into the cavity as you can. So that's on the order of 10 to the 25 photons. So that's your emitter. And then if there are dark photons out there in the dark part of the universe, uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't have at least some tiny amount of mixing with ordinary photons, which means that if you make 10 to the 25 photons, there's some probability that they will convert into dark photons and then can convert back into ordinary photons. Uh, if they're, while they're converted to dark photons, they can of course go through walls or anything else that ordinary photons can't go through. And so this is an example of what's called a light shining through walls experiment, um, where you take ordinary light, you mix it, you hope a little bit with dark photons, and, and that allows you to have a signal someplace where you shouldn't have a signal if you had ordinary photons. So, so for that experiment, you have the emitter of photons, but then you also need the receiver. And where the quantum technology comes in is that the in the receiver, if you're lucky, you'll get a couple of these photons that came from uh, dark photons converting backward into ordinary photons. And so I need a cavity in which I can detect that I have one or two or three or a few uh, photons at a time and that they weren't there before. So that's the quantum technology part of this. And of course, you ha one thing you have to do is you have to make these guys really cold because otherwise you're going to be swamped by thermal noise already. So that sounds hard. And indeed, these kinds of experiments, although they've been tried before, they didn't get too far. But now that we're gearing up for all this uh, quantum technology, it's become easy to do this kind of experiment using the same technology we, we would use to try to build quantum computers. So in fact, here's the experiment. It already exists. It's called dark SRF. Uh, here's, the, uh, oops. here's the emitter cavity, this guy here. Here's the receiver cavity. And uh, you have to be very careful that these guys can't talk to each other by any normal means. That's the hard part with an experiment like this because they're not that far apart. And so you got to make sure that you know cables and, and things like that are not allowing them to talk to each other. And then you got to take this whole thing, which as you see is about the same size as a person, and you have to make it really cold. 
So you need some place where you can stick something that's six feet tall into liquid helium to make it cold. So that's uh, something that we have at Fermilab here. You see it, here it is in what we call the vertical cryogenic test stand. And eventually you, that gets you down to about one and a half Kelvin. Eventually you'd like to get it uh, really cold, as cold as you possibly can, say 10 millikelvin. And to do that, you need to put it into a dilution fridge because that's the only way you can get big things that cold. Um, so then you got to go out and buy a really big dilution fridge, but that's the kind of thing you need for quantum computers as well. So we have that technology. So this is already happening. In fact, they already have results on this. They, they could have, if they had been lucky, they could have made a discovery of dark photons already, but they still have many orders of magnitude to go in, in the reach for this. Here's another example of an experiment that you would never imagine doing except for the quantum technology that's, that's moving all this forward. So this is something we're also building at Fermilab. It's called uh, Magus 100. It is uh, cold atom interferometers. So this is sort of doing for individual cold atoms what you're used to doing with photons in terms of uh, getting them to interfere with uh, themselves and do interesting quantum things on macroscopic scales. So the idea here is that we have uh, a 100 meter deep shaft at Fermilab that goes down to where we're doing neutrino stuff. And we're gonna put a vacuum pipe in that 100 meter shaft. Uh, and then we have super cold atoms. So with cold, it's now you can just buy little boxes that make cold atoms uh, for you. So it's easy to make cold atoms. They're so cold that if you drop them uh, in a vacuum pipe like this, they just drop like, like they were a rock. They're so cold that they're, they're hardly, their thermal motion is, is reasonably negligible. And so you can just think of, it, think of this as cold atoms that are kind of leisurely dropping in this 100 meter vacuum pipe. And then once they're doing that, you can manipulate them and you do that with lasers. And they have already shown, it's, the Stanford group has already shown a long time ago that they can take a single cold atom and they can hit it with a laser in such a way that they can put it into a superposition of moving on two different paths. And then you can prove it was a superposition because at the end of the day, as you would do with photons, you can bring it back together and show that a single atom is interfering with itself. So that's uh, a, an atom interferometer. And what's amazing about this is that they've already done this on the scale of a centimeter. So this is not microscopic quantum physics. This is macroscopic quantum physics. And for the Magus 100 experiment, they'll do this on the scale of 10 meters. So they'll take a single atom and they'll put that atom in a superposition of two different paths that are 10 meters apart, which to me, that's already, I don't, I don't care if you can't do anything with it, just demonstrating you can do that to me would be an amazing, uh, an amazing quantum demonstration. But what's even more interesting about these kinds of devices is that when you send a single atom on two different paths and then have it interfere with itself, it is now incredibly sensitive to whether anything disturbed those two paths. So for example, if a gravity wave happened to go through your detector while the atom was doing this, it will notice that something disturbed its path. And so this is a, a, a new way of making a gravity wave detector. It's kind of similar to the way that LIGO works, but LIGO uses photons to do this. And here we're using atoms to do this. And that's important because that changes the frequency of the gravity waves that you're sensitive to. So if I compare this, say, to LIGO, this is, is uh, sensitive to lower frequency gravity waves than LIGO. So if you look, for example, at the kind of events that LIGO sees where they see two black holes merging, that kind of signal would be seen here first because the black holes are spiraling in faster and faster and faster. And what LIGO sees is the highest frequency end of that chain, whereas Magus might pick up the same black hole mergers uh, six months before LIGO sees them. So this is a whole, if it works, we'll see if it works, this is a whole new way of doing gravity wave detection based on this kind of quantum technology. So that's pretty exciting. And then I already mentioned the uh, teleportation. And this is what it looks like in the real world. So this is our FQNET quantum teleportation setup at Fermilab. Uh, it's got uh, a laser. One of these things is a laser. It has crystals that make pairs of entangled photons because you need entangled photons if you want to do something with quantum information, interesting with quantum teleportation. 
that's here somewhere in this table. And then you can uh, you produce these things at a frequency that you can put them in ordinary telecom fiber. So you, if, for example, you put a spool of, of that fiber in the lab, you can actually demonstrate, and we already did this, that you can send entangled photons off 50 kilometers, let's say, down fibers uh, before you actually measure them. And then at the end of the day, you measure them. And the way you measure single photons is with these superconducting nanowire single photon detectors that we get from JPL, um, which are the world's best uh, single photon detectors for this sort of device. Uh, the reason that JPL has them is because they're in the space business. And if you want to do long range space communications at the end of the day, the way to do that is with single photon laser systems, um, very similar to quantum teleportation systems. So that's why they have these, they developed the world's best single photon detectors. So this is the, the Caltech JPL folks that have been putting this together. And this thing is an example of technology development, but the fact that high energy physicists are able to be uh, the people that uh, do a better job on this than had been done before is, I think, not too surprising because, again, at the end of the day, these are complicated, very sensitive solid state devices. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that we do for detectors all the time. And so a, a group of Caltech high energy physicists is able to do this. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of second nature for them. So in fact, we have, uh, thanks to that group, we have the world's uh, by far uh, best quantum teleportation system. They can produce, uh, they can send entangled photons down 50 kilometers of fiber and prove that they did teleportation. The teleportation is 95% or better uh, fidelity in terms of actually Bob getting the signal that, that Alice was trying to send and they can do it a thousand times a second. So, so this is, it's, it's the world's best land-based uh, teleportation network. The Chinese have also been doing uh, stuff in space with quantum teleportation, so it's a lot of excitement in that area. There's a question in the chat asking. Yes, that's, um, in fact, we're at the end here, so let's do questions. What is the frequency band of the interferometer, the atom interferometer? Yeah, so um, it, it's roughly one hertz. So if you, if you compare that to LIGO, which is roughly kilohertz, you get an idea of, of the range. There's a range, but I, that gives you roughly the idea. So that's the lightning review. There's a lot going on. It's, it's a really new field. We, we were doing zero quantum at Fermilab three years ago, and now it's a, it's a huge program. So this, it's an, it's ex, it's, ex, it's, it's an example of a good exponential growth as opposed to a bad exponential growth. Um, I had another question about the, the um, lattice experiments that you can do with the yes. quantum computer. So there was error bars on those plots. So are, when you, do you get a different result every time you run it and then you're averaging like you do with Monte Carlo or is there error coming from th something else? Yeah, so th there's a variety of errors. There, there is just the fact that you have to measure things at the end of the day. So you try to get around that error just by running it many times. That's not really a problem because th the flip side of the fact that these computers have very short coherence times is the fact that if I have to run it 10,000 times, it's okay because it only takes 100 mi microseconds each time. So, so that, that source of error, I would say, is under control. There's a source of error from noise. So even when the, the program doesn't die from quantum decoherence, there is still noise because the qubits talk to each other in ways that you don't want. So depending on what gates are talking to which are connecting which qubits, you get various sources of noise. That's a source of error. That turns out to be not as bad as you would think because you can actually measure the error and then you can extrapolate your results to usually to the zero noise limit just by looking at how the noise noise affects each run by different amounts. So you can basically make a plot as a function of the noise. Uh, and then there's uh, these trotterization errors I talked about. There's all these discretization errors from the fact that you didn't really do continuous quantum field theory, you did you discretize in various ways. Uh, so there's a bunch of things you have to worry about. Uh, but it's, it works, I would say, better than your naive expectation would be. 
There was another question here from Tom saying, that's Lisa's band, isn't it? Actually, it's between the Lisa, this is for gravity waves. It's between the Lisa frequency band and the LIGO band. So it's, 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 so that's even better because Lisa, we're, we're hoping is gonna happen. And this would sort of fill in that whole frequency band. Wow, I just came across a paper which claims entanglement with trillion atoms. Uh, I don't think it's that hard to demonstrate entanglement with a very large number of atoms, let's say. The real problem has to do with controlling these things, right? I mean, entanglement is the natural consequence of dynamics as, as we saw in, in, in our simple examples. So, the hard part is what can you do with it in a controlled way? So you got to, in fact, I will, I will make a, a very categorical warning. Almost anything you read in the press about quantum is hyped by usually a large amount. People are doing lots of interesting things. There's lots of uh, progress happening, but by the time it gets filtered through, through the press, the, it's like everything is the breakthrough. So apparently we're having, you know, a thousand breakthroughs a year. Whereas I, I would say we're making rapid but incremental progress on most of these things. Um, I have another question just about kind of the, this like ultra cold infrastructure you, you kind of need. Um, yes. Like how, um, how big of an issue is that? Cause it seems like it's really hard to get stuff as cold as you need to get it to like actually do these computations. Does that seem like that's something that's going to go away? Is that like one of the major issues or is that? Yeah. Just... So th this is something that people argue about. So if you want to get below uh, a Kelvin, which you, we're su for superconducting qubits, you really want to run them. It's sort of 10 to 30 millikelvin. You got to buy a dilution fridge. You can buy big dilution fridges. Um, you, you can buy a dilution fridge that's as big as, you know, an ordinary refrigerator. So, and you can put big things in it. Um, but one of the problems you have, for example, is suppose I had a quantum computer with 10,000 qubits. If I need 10,000 microwave cables coming out of each one of my uh, qubits, and I have to get those 10,000 cables out of the dilution fridge, then you're in trouble. Because now you're trying to get from this super cold environment back to room temperature with, you know, a, a thousand things that go from one to the other. So, so for that, we're actually looking at trying to do the electronics that the regular electronics that goes with running and reading out from the quantum computer inside the cryogenic environment so that you don't have to have stuff going from room temperature inside. Um, another approach you can take is to say, well, I, I don't want to do cryogenic stuff. I want to do room temperature qubits. How do I do that? There are working quantum computers, um, both Honeywell and a startup company named IonQ have actual quantum computers that use ions instead of superconducting oscillators. And they work, you can run it, you can run programs on them. That's sort of the same level of complexity as what I was showing you. And I would say the jury is still out on who's gonna win. The, the ion computers, although they work at room temperature, they're also really slow and it's kind of hard to see how you would scale them up. Um, of course, it's kind of hard to see with the superconducting qubits too, how to scale them up. So, so nobody, the answer is nobody really knows uh, how this is going to be, I would say, five years from now. We at Fermilab, because we're a high energy physics lab, we're going to build the world's largest dilution fridge because the, the commercially available ones are not good enough for us. So we're going to build one that's sort of, you know, two stories high. Um, and that, that would be enough to build, I don't know, a 10,000 qubit quantum computer. So I, I think the cryogenics is not really the thing that's going to limit us. Um, we're we're picking up lots of questions in the chat, Joe. All right, what have we got here? I still feel a little hard to understand the atom interferometer. Is the ultra cold atom traveling in the arms? How did they in, inter? Oh yeah, okay. So you know, let me go back to that. You're right. I I went pretty fast over that. So let me. There was an essential feature that I didn't tell you. So, for each single atom you actually kick it with a photon in such a way that it's in a superposition of going 
two different directions. So that's how you get superpositions. And you should think of this as being the scale of centimeters or, or meters. And then you actually are able to kick it in such a way that eventually it's not in that superposition anymore and you have a chance to see an interference pattern. So that's your, something you're doing atom by atom. But now in reality, in order to make this a very sensitive device, you wanna have at least two places where you're making atom interferometry. In fact, we're gonna have three of them here. And the reason for that is that since you're kicking this thing with a laser, the laser has some kind of noise and jitter built into it. And so if all I did was kick atoms with lasers, I my sensitivity would be limited by the amount of jitter in my laser. And so you're back to the same problems that LIGO has. Um, here, if you have several atom interferometers and they're in a vacuum pipe and they're in free fall and you run them with the same laser, you can get the laser effects to cancel out and you get something that now is just limited by the properties of the atoms themselves. And so that actually gets you much, much more sensitive device. So that's why this thing is actually called an atom gradiometer because it's the difference between uh, inter interferometers uh, in, in, in vertically. So unlike LIGO, which is, has two arms that go horizontally, this is, if you like, three interferometers spaced vertically. Okay, what else do we have here? Do any algorithms require hybrid quantum plus classical computers? Yes, in fact, I think it is inevitable that the future of this is that when somebody finds uh, a real science problem that quantum computers are good for, you're gonna end up doing most of that calculation classically, and there's only gonna be a piece of it that you do on the quantum computer. It's all gonna be hybrid. Um, you know, it was the same with what Peter Shore did. His, his thing where you, you break RSA encryption, you actually do most of it on a classical computer, and it's only the quantum Fourier transform is the part you would do on a quantum computer. So that, that's, that's the way all this is gonna work, I think. Okay, I have heard the quantum supremacy of the Google computer was controversial. Can you explain why? Yes, and in fact, it's a funny story, and I got the story from John Martinez himself. So, so John Martinez uh, said four years ago, I'm gonna build a quantum supremacy quantum computer with 50 qubits, and I'm, this is the program I'm gonna run when I have it, and this is what it's gonna do, and then you guys, you go and try and reproduce this on the world's largest supercomputer, and good luck. So when that finally happened last year, uh, Martinez did exactly what he said he was gonna do. He had exactly the computer he said he was gonna build. It performed exactly the way he said it was gonna perform. He ran the program he said he was gonna run and he got the results that you would expect from a quantum computer. The controversy had to do with the fact of how do you try to reproduce this on Summit, which is the world's largest supercomputer, which is at Oak Ridge. And there, they hadn't really put that much, I guess, uh, effort into thinking about it. And so they ran something which took a really long time to run and basically was impractical to run on, on that computer. And they said, okay, we're done. Uh, we give up. Uh, the quantum computer is beating us. But then people that do algorithms for a living on classical computers came back and said, well, but maybe, you know, you didn't really use the best algorithm. You could have done this and then it would have been, you know, three times faster to run and then, you know, Maybe you could really run this on Summit. And so maybe it isn't really quantum spring. But this is all nonsense, because first of all, it just has to do with the classical computing. And secondly, the power of quantum computers grows exponentially as, you, as they're bigger. So you know, even if you catch up with the 53 qubit quantum computer, once it's a 100 qubit quantum computer, you know, that's the difference between two to the 100 and two to the 53. So it's, so it's not that it's twice as good, it's you know, orders and orders of magnitude better. So, so inevitably, once uh, we get to this more or less the quantum supremacy regime, which we're certainly at now, uh, the classical supercomputers fall behind. But, but the big caveat there is that they fall behind for a worthless problem that nobody's interested in. It was just a demonstration. And the real question now is what are the interesting problems that you could do in these things? Okay. For atom interferometry to get centimeters long superposition, wouldn't we need atoms to have very small velocities to get large de Broglie levels? Yes, so that's the cold. So cold atoms, you can get them down to something like one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. So they are super cold. They are moving, but they're moving incredibly slowly compared to what you would normally expect.
and they're free falling. Yes. But 100 meters, it takes, you know, a few seconds to fall 100 meters. The, uh, the other limit on this thing is you have to have a very high vacuum, right? Because you want only the atoms that you're, you care about and you don't want other stuff in the vacuum. So that's, that's again why you go to high energy physicists because who knows how to build a really big uh, high vacuum system, a pipe that has a really high vacuum in it. We build them for accelerators horizontally. So this is the same thing, but it's vertical. Well, it looks like we're getting to the end of questions. So this is, uh, this is your last chance. Uh, Alexandra Constantino, yes, she says, can I make a short announcement? Sure. Uh, Evan, uh, will you unmute Ms. Constantino? Hey, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. So um, uh, uh, there were about 13 designs submitted, I believe, for uh, different t-shirts. So please go and uh, vote for your top three designs. I'm posting the Google Forms link in the chat and I will also post it on the t-shirt uh, channel. Uh, so please vote by 5 p.m. today. Um, and then after the student talks, we will uh, present, I'll show everybody the results and we can make some more uh, decisions on what to do next. Thank you. Cool. Okay, and she's posted uh, a website there, so grab it before we disappear. Uh, okay, so it's a quarter past 10, I think. Uh, are there any more questions floating around? Um, well, you make it cold. That's the last question in the chat. You make it really, really cold. cold. <laughs> okay, and then, and then you do general relativity, right? You, you, uh, yeah. you make a gravitational redshift, which people have already done. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we're at the end of Joe's talks. It was very interesting. I have things to read. Uh, I think we all do. Uh, so let's stand up and stretch and come back in uh, half an hour for the last talk of Tassie. All right. Bye everyone.